the core idea of reflexivity is reflex. So, para waktu ke doktor dan doktornya pake hamarini dan kata segini, that is a reflex. Ya itu reflex. And so, a reflex is something that happens without thinking. It is automatic. Um, for the purposes of thinking about the second modernity, I propose that it's useful to think of not just automatic responses, but also semi-automatic responses. So uh, automatic responses are things like anger and lust and greed. And when we are children, we learn to control our automatic, our automatic responses in order to develop more refined responses. And so we become polite and deferential uh, and uh, more refined. So they are still reflexes. We train our reflexes so that we don't get mad. Supaya tidak langsung mara, supaya bisa sopan dan maranya tetap dalam saja. So we learn uh, semi-automatic, we, we create semi-automatic responses. We design our reflexes. And that's the key operation when you apply the idea of reflexes to design architecture in cities. Um, there's another principle that is part of the second modernity, and that is it's important not to just talk about things, but to do things. Let me buy Jangan hanya omong-omong mengenai sesuatu, harus langsung buat, itu langsung kerja. So, so Missouri in the United States, where I come from, uh, Missouri is the show me state. The people in Missouri are skeptical. If you tell them something, they won't believe you. Uh, but if you show them, then they will believe you. You have to show them. So the first example of, that I want to bring in here is Bill Bao, which in a way is the poster child of creative cities. Um, the mythology of Bill Bao is that Bill Bao was a very depressed industrial city. Uh, Frank Gehry came in, the star architect, came in and he designed such a brilliant museum that it saved the city. That is not true. That is not what happened. Bill Bao was part of an extensive program of complete restructuring, starting with the autonomy movement in 1979, which is, sim which is an interesting point, karena di Indonesia juga ada jaman autonomi dengan reformasi. Itu yang mulai semua yang terjadi di Bill Bao. So everything started with autonomy uh, in Bill Bao. And the goal was not to build a museum. The goal was to transform the economy through education, transportation, uh, and industrial uh, renovation, uh, renewing the port, but also uh, increasing the infrastructure of the service sector, especially through education. And if you'll notice, Bilbao is just a tiny little uh, event in the midst of everything else that is happening. And so the port was renewed, uh, the transportation system was uh, installed, so light uh, rail, uh, heavy rail, bus, uh, busway, uh, and many other initiatives. And the sum total of all of these efforts resulted in a turning around of the population decline. And at the very end, there was this thing called Bilbao, uh, the museum. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, they transformed the housing, was part of it. Um, now, I want to move from Bilbao, Spain, to Medellin, uh, Colombia, America Latin. So, uh, how many people have heard of Medellin, Colombia? Raise your hand if you have heard. Medellin, Colombia. Nobody? Okay. You've heard of it? Drugs. Yes. Drugs, yes. <laughs> Made in Colombia, if you've heard of it, it's because you saw a movie in which the drug lord uh, was based in um, Made in Colombia, Pablo Escobar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. So Pablo Escobar, the kingpin of drugs and narcotics. And so um, it, was the, it became, things got so bad 
that it became the murder capital of the world, but then it was turned around. And if you were going to make the same mistake about Medellin that we make about Bilbao, you would say Medellin was turned around by this library, that an architect came in, built a library, and then left, and the people of Medellin, Colombia were saved. This is not true. I'm sorry if you're an architect and you think that architecture can save the world. Architecture, you, I think you can't save the world without architecture, but that's different. If you are just an architect, you probably can't do much of anything except maybe, I don't know, there's a lot you can do, don't feel bad, but if you want to stay in architecture and stay in the safe, small world of architecture, you're not going to be able to achieve anything like this. And so I'm going to now tell the story. Uh, I told very quickly the story of Bill Bao, which is available to everyone because it's a very famous story, but people still don't see the, the bigger story. I'm going to tell the story of Medellin just a little bit more detailed because uh, it's not a well-known story yet. But I predict that Medellin, Colombia will be much more famous and much more important than Bilbao. Manuel Tsaya, historias de Charita Medellin, ya le vi penting dari para Bilbao. So uh, this is Sergio Fajardo. He uh, is a PhD mathematician who got his PhD in the United States. And he came home to uh, Medellin and he decided that he wanted to take back his city for the future. So he ran for mayor. He never had office before. He promised, if you elect me, I will not steal your money. And he won a landslide election. And he was the mayor of Medellin from 2004 to 2008. This is uh, just to get you set. This is Colombia. Um, and this is Medellin in Colombia. It's extremely isolated, and in many ways, it's like Singapore, uh, except it was much more successful than Singapore. It was an industrial, uh, uh, the capital, one of the richest cities in Latin America, uh, an industrial capital uh, up through the 1970s, but then the drug, the narco terrorism moved in and it was transformed. The, um, Kampung Kumo uh, expanded, the slums expanded up the slopes of the basin, and um, it got to the point where the murder rate reached um, 381 murders per 100,000 inhabitants in 1991. It was, this is the highest rate of murder ever recorded in human history. So this was the most dangerous place to be in ever. In, the, in human history. Um, when Fajardo and his team came into office, uh, his, his goal was to create, and this I'll go back to him, when he was elected, his program was education. Uh, the military was winning the battle against narco-terrorism. The soldiers were coming home to Medellin because there was no more war to be fought in the narco-terrorism wars. And these soldiers, left Medellin when they were 12 years old and they had no education and now they're 30 years old, they're coming back to Medellin, they still do not know how to read or write, they still don't know how to do mathematics, but they have uh, an automatic weapon. They have an AK-47 and they are very good at using the AK-47. And so all of these young men returning to Medellin with no skills except killing. And so uh, Sergio Fajardo said, we have to intercept them. We have to say, give us your gun. We will give you an education. We will give you a new start. Um, but he had a problem. Politicians for decades or for hundreds of years have been promising things and not delivering. He had no credibility. He needed to demonstrate, and this is where the Missouri rules come in, he needed to demonstrate clearly that he was serious that he wasn't just, it wasn't just omong omong kosong. It was betul betul benar. Uh, and so what he did is he used architecture. Okay, so here's where architecture enters. 
Architecture is not the hero of our story. The hero of our story is Sergio Fajardo's education program. Architecture was just the vehicle that created political legitimacy. Here's how he did it. They wanted to build cultural centers and libraries, and they wanted to upgrade the, uh, the mass transit system in Medellin. And they had all the plans laid out. And of course, like every other city in the world, when you build something fantastic and beautiful, you give it to the rich people. Everyone knows that you can't give a museum to a poor community because they will break it. Everyone knows that you can't give a transportation system to poor people they will break it. And so all of the plans were there. When Sergio Fajardo was elected, he took those plans and he just moved them. And he said, who needs this the most? Who will be transformed? Who will it impact the most? And the answer was, the poorest of the poor. And so they had to figure out who needed it the most. And so they made a map, they put a pin Every time there was a dead body found, every time there was a murder, they put a pin in the map. And then they, at the end, they stood back and they looked at these clouds of dead bodies on the map. And they uh, squinted their eyes and figured out, this is the place where the most dead bodies were showing up. And his team said, uh, and he said, that's where I want to build the most beautiful cultural center and park and transit system in the world. It's for these people. And his team said, you can't do that. They're poor. They'll break it. And besides, it's way up on the top of a mountain. You can't build a cultural center, a world-class cultural center at the top of the mountain. Uh, but he did. There was an international campaign uh, competition. The winner uh, was a Spanish architect. The money was donated by the King of Spain. So this is the King of Spain Library. Uh, it's a fantastic library. It's better than any library I've ever seen before. Uh, and it was put in a park. This is the same site. And uh, it transformed the entire community. But it's up at the top of a mountain. So how do you do it? It's, it's like uh, I went to Italy on my honeymoon, and it was a beautiful place, the hill towns. This felt just like where I went on my honeymoon in Italy. Uh, and it as uh, been written up in the New York Times as one of the hottest destinations. Um, this is Sergio Fajardo. I invited him to Boston. He uh, presented these things, and I've been working with him since the end of his term in 2008 to spread the, the story of Medellin. Um, all the cities in Colombia were uh, experiencing the same problems of murder and after the military won the battles, the murder rate dropped. But Medellin is the dotted line at the top. Medellin had the highest murder rate, and they dropped it below or down to where all the other cities were. And they have kept it low even as other cities have, have risen back up. So here are some of the projects. Um, so Sergio Fajardo, in order to convince people that he was serious, and he only had four years to do this because there's one term. Uh, he, he didn't just build one library, he built five libraries. And he didn't just build libraries, he built schools. He built about 60 schools from scratch. And he also built these cultural centers. He also um, renovated over 100 schools. And these schools, uh, the new ones, the renovated schools, are scattered up in the hills in the poorest neighborhoods. He said to the rich people of Medellin, he said, uh, sorry, uh, you come next, but I have to serve the people who need it most first. And so he broke all of the rules, and he did this. Uh, he also broke the rules of international development. He said the housing. Uh, who cares about the housing? Let's keep the housing. So he did not improve the housing at all. And the people said, please don't improve our housing. What we need are the cultural assets that the wealthy are enjoying. And so um, the, way this be, uh, the way this is reflexive, and it, this is uh, an example of the new approach to architecture and urbanism. It is, it is, is it creative city? 
Yes, it is Creative City, but it is more than Creative City. It is being flexible, it is being uh, bottom up, but it's also being top down. Some things you cannot do bottom up, some things you have to do top down, left to right, side to side, diagonal, every which way. So the strategies are open. And so um, the way this it was done was very much a clear illustration of the reflexive modernity, the re processes of reflexive modernization that are characteristic of the second period of modernity. So I'm going to end there, and I hope you have some questions. Terima kasih. Thank you.